So we're of course going to spend this entire video talking about this Novo Series J. But before we do, you should know that this video is not sponsored. I bought this guitar with my own money. I've never met anyone from Novo. I've never met Red Shaw. But he did teach me something that explains why this review will be different from every other review on YouTube. Throughout guitar history, there's been periods of perfection and then rejection. And what he's found is people either prefer guitars from a perfection period or a rejection period. And I think I'm more uh, along the lines of the rejection. I like guitars that maybe aren't perfectly built. Somebody on this channel watching this video prefers something that is exact and perfect down to every single last detail. And that person is me. For the last 18 years, I've only dreamed of modern, perfect guitars, and I'm such a perfectionist that I had to make an already perfect guitar even more perfect. More on that later. But actually, one of my subscribers put it perfectly when he said this about Novo. It's got all the charm of an old classic with the reliability and stability of a new guitar. So we're going to start from the headstock and work our way all the way down. But before we do, let me give you a quick overview of why this guitar is a radical change for me. You may or may not know this already, but this is my number one guitar. It's a Parker Nightfly that's been heavily modded around my two major idiosyncrasies. Number one, I'm very sensitive to noise. And number two, I am overly obsessed with efficiency. So these are ratio tuners. They tune like three seconds faster than regular tuners, so I had to have those. I usually have tape behind the nut to make sure there's no noise back there. These are noiseless pickups, and even when I split them into single coil mode or into P90 mode, even those modes are completely silent. There is just a tiny bit of noise that can come from the back of this bridge in this area here. This is like three centimeters of space between the saddle and the back of the bridge. The tiny bit of noise from there bothers me so much I have to put tape right there. Of course, we have noiseless springs in the back. And here's another big secret on basically all of my guitars. I exclusively play flat wound strings just so that I don't get any noise from my fingers. And I do that even when I'm playing heavy chugga chugga music. <laughs> That too was with flat wrong strings, and that's how crazy I am. So of course, the Novo is intended to be a traditional style of guitar. We have traditional tuners, they're not locking. We have noise behind the nut. Uh, the bridge itself is very noisy. Check this out. All of that happens basically all the time when you're playing. These pickups are very, very noisy. They're not noiseless pickups, but even with all of that stuff, all of these idiosyncrasies that I would usually hate, that would usually drive me crazy, I fell in love with this guitar 90 seconds after I started playing it. And we're going to talk about that in this review. The first thing is of course this absolutely huge vintage looking headstock. To me, it kind of looks like those old Fender headstocks and I quite like it, it looks awesome. And then we have these vintage tuners and they're of course aged. We'll talk about the aging process a bit later. But even though they're aged, even though they look vintage, they work amazingly well. Tuning has been amazing, which we'll also talk about later. And then we have something pretty cool here. We have this traditional old school string tree. We, and then we have, of course, a bone nut. And this bone nut is not bleached. It looks like real bone. And it was cut absolutely perfectly. I think these guitars ship with nines or tens. I have eights on here and they still feel perfect because of this nut. So as we move from the nut and start to go down to the neck, we have a bunch to talk about here. First thing, this neck is big, it's hard. This neck is pretty thick. It won't be too thick if you're used to traditional guitars, then it's pretty normal. But if you're used to the modern shreddy guitars, this is going to feel thick to you. That being said, you may or may not know this, I really enjoy thick necks and this neck feels absolutely amazing. This is so comfortably thick. Now here's the thing. I mentioned that the neck itself is hard and that's the best way I can describe it. This might be a roasted wood. I'm not sure. Again, I'll put the spec on the screen. But something about this neck just feels really hard. 
especially when you compare it to the body that is a much softer wood. We'll get to all of that later, I promise. Now, let's talk about the fretwork. Novo lists nickel frets on their website, but I believe they may also make guitars with stainless steel frets. And I want to say that these uh, frets are stainless steel, but I'm not going to say that until Novo gets back to me with the actual specs based on the serial number, because either these are the most perfect, shiny, well-polished nickel frets, or they are just stainless steel. Either way, they are absolutely flawless. The leveling is flawless, but we have to talk about the fret edges. And this is going to be a little bit of a rant. If you've watched any of my other reviews, you may know that I get pretty annoyed with people, different YouTubers who exclusively focus on the fret edges and how they need to be perfectly round like a ball and all of this nonsense. And oftentimes they'll see perfect rounded fret edges and they'll think to themselves, that's a perfect fret job when in all actuality, the fret has to also be laid well, it has to be level well, and all of that stuff. It has to be a good material. Even all stainless steel is not made the same, so on and so forth. Why am I saying all of that stuff? So if you were to compare the fret edges on this guitar to a modern guitar, you might not be impressed because they're not perfectly rolled off like a ball and all of that stuff, but that does not matter. As you go up and down the neck, super hard and super fast. You're never going to get a poke. This would never fatigue your hand. So let's talk about the high fret access on this guitar. You may remember, if you watched the last review, I talked about this Gibson guitar, and I talked about how the high fret access was good, but my hand was hitting this horn when I was playing up here. A few people in the comments also pointed out that I do have large hands and that might be causing it. And they're probably right. Since these are my only hands and the only hands I have to test with, I sometimes forget that everyone doesn't have hands that are like mine. Point being, the high fret axis on this guitar was very good. But for me personally, this horn was in the way when I was playing a lot of different things. Okay. The Novo guitar, of course, doesn't have that issue whatsoever. And that's because there is literally no horn. There is a little bit of a horn, but by the time you get to it, you're never going to experience any issues playing up here. And just to prove it to you, I will give you an example right now of me playing some high fret access stuff. <laughs> Of course, the other thing that contributes to high fret accessibility is how the neck joins with the body. In this case, we have, as you might expect, a very simple, traditional four bolt design. I'm also somewhat obsessed with heel joints and smooth transitions between uh, the neck itself and the body. It doesn't always matter, but in general, I just like to see it. It makes me feel warm inside. Here's an example, of course. We have another obsession of mine, this D'Angelico guitar, and we see this absolutely amazing joint. Of course, when you compare these two guitars, this one is made to be a traditional guitar, so we don't have anything like that. But does it actually matter? Honestly, no. When I take my thumb and I place it right at where the neck joins the body, my hand is still plenty comfortable. And from here, my pinky can reach the top fret. No issue whatsoever. I would never need more access than this. In fact, I can move my thumb back a full inch. So now I'm not even touching the neck joint and my pinky can still just about reach the second to last fret. Is the neck joint super pretty? No, it's not. But it's a traditional guitar. And this is what traditional neck joints looked like. Okay, so now we need to talk about the playability of this guitar. And to do so, I really recommend you watch the video for the Gibson guitar. Um, just skip to the middle when I say like story time or whatever, because I talk about this concept of digging in and of how the Gibson guitar makes me dig in. 
And everyone in the comments said things like, you know, oh, you sound so much better on the Gibson guitar. My point of that story wasn't that I liked the Gibson guitar because it makes me dig in. My point of that story that I think was missed is that on the Gibson guitar, even if I don't want to dig in, I have to. I can't play this guitar in any other way besides aggressively. And that doesn't work for me. If you're Philip Sace, that works for you. And I love you if you're watching Philip Sace. I don't know why you're watching this, but if you're him or if you're someone like him or if you like that style, that might be great for you. But me personally, I don't like to dig in a lot. I like to dig in very, very selectively. So here's the thing about this guitar. I can dig in on this guitar if I want to, just like I can dig in on the Gibson guitar. Except I don't have to. I can if I want to, and if I don't want to, I can still play my very mellow stuff. But here's the other thing. I cannot play fast on this guitar. On this guitar, I can play all of my favorite legato stuff just about everywhere. That's pretty remarkable because this guitar is not made for that type of thing, I would assume. And yet, in terms of comfort and my ability to play that style, this is as good as almost every other guitar I've played, including the shreddy ones. I think the Mayones guitar I had is probably like half a point better in terms of shreddy, maybe even a full point better. But for this to be able to do everything a Gibson can do and to be able to do almost everything a shreddy guitar can do, that's one of the main reasons why this guitar really has me rethinking everything I thought about vintage guitars and like new vintage and boutique and all of that stuff. In fact, I love this guitar so much. I did an entire podcast right after making this video where I basically try to figure out what vintage new guitar I should buy next. So if you know a lot about vintage guitars, check out that podcast, it's linked below and leave a comment helping me sort out the prices and what I should be looking for in my next guitar that is a Novo or maybe a similar brand. So now we have to talk about something else that I am super, super excited about with this guitar, and that is this absolutely ginormous body. Now, I said the headstock is very big. The body is also incredibly big. So I'm exactly six feet tall, and I have a very long wingspan compared to my height. So I have like a 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, wingspan, although I'm only six foot tall. Point being, I have a strange, lanky build. And the size of this body is so, so very comfortable for me. As you may already know, I do in general love offset guitars because offset guitars are a bit larger and you have more place for your body if you are a slightly larger individual. But this offset is even larger than a standard offset. I mean, it's absolutely ginormous, but it is so very, very comfortable to play. I've never felt a guitar body that is as perfectly shaped for me. We do have a bit of a belly cut up here, and we do have a very slight forearm contour. If you're a smaller person, like if you're like, I don't know, five foot, five, one, five, two, and you have short arms, I don't know if this guitar is going to be very comfortable for you. It also has a very strange balance, if that makes sense. So there is absolutely no neck dive, but the body is so soft and so lightweight. And then the neck is so hard. And so there's this interesting juxtaposition where you have this hard thing on your hands. It just feels unique. I'm not used to guitars that feel like this. You know, that's not good or bad. It's just different. And uh, well, I guess it's good because I do quite like it. These guitars do come relic. I think that's a standard Novo thing. And to be completely honest, as a non-vintage guitar guy, I never understood the whole relic thing. However, 
from an economic perspective, I had an epiphany about relics because of this guitar. So walk with me down this journey for a second. So I ordered the guitar and I wasn't thinking about specs. I wasn't thinking about the relic. I was just playing the guitar. And then all of a sudden I noticed this mark right here. And then I remembered that the listing said that this was in excellent condition. Maybe I should get some more money from that guy because there should be nothing wrong. And then it hit me, oh yeah, this guitar is relic And then I thought to myself, I wonder if that mark was part of the relic or if he made that mark when he was playing. And then it really hit me. Let me give you a different example so that we can get this all lined up together and then we'll have the aha moment together like I just had it. So this guitar is a Parker Fly from the late 90s. It is mint condition. There is not one scratch on this guitar although it is over 20 years old. The whole thing about buying a guitar like this, that's shiny and pristine that I never thought about is that when you're shopping for these guitars or if you wanna sell this guitar in the future, every time you get a scratch on it, that's like $100 down the drain. If this has, you know, seven scratches on the front of, on the, front of the body, even if it's still perfect, plays perfectly, functions perfectly, just has those aesthetic scratches, that's going to take $1,000 off this guitar. You scratch this guitar, your value drops immediately by hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. And just to prove my point, this is another Parker Nightfly guitar. That was a Parker Fly, this is a Parker Nightfly. This guitar, if you look around it, is beat up badly. And it was that way when I bought it. But this guitar still functions and plays absolutely perfectly. If this guitar was in pristine condition, you can sell this instantly on Reverb for $1,200. If you wanted to wait a few months, you could probably get $1,500 or $1,600 for it. I paid $600 for this guitar, less than half of basically its value, just because it has these marks, even though it functions perfectly. And that's the thing that I realized about vintage guitars. We already discussed the fact that I don't know if these are stainless steel frets or not, but let's just for the sake of our discussion, pretend they're stainless steel frets. We know stainless steel frets are never going to wear out. The only other thing that can ruin the value of a guitar are paint flaws, scratches, all of that stuff. No one is ever going to know whether or not the mark is from the factory, from Novo, the Novo team, or if it's from the idiot who owned it last. And so I just have a feeling that these guitars are going to hold the value unbelievably well. And in fact, well, we'll talk about price later, but I suddenly understand why, at least for me, a relic might make sense. If I was going to buy a guitar and there was like maybe $300 to get a relic on it, I might spend that money now because I know that gives me some leeway in case I scratch it up a little bit the value won't inc won't continue to drop so fast just because you have a mark here and there. So that was my relic discovery. Okay, so now let's talk about this bridge. And of course, like with everything else, I am very, very picky about bridges on guitars. It has to be floating, it has to be a tremolo for me, and it has to have good tuning stability. And let me just say, this bridge's tuning stability is But here are some other things that are important to me that this bridge might even be better for than I had originally thought it even could be. In a nutshell, traditional strats usually have a bar that is almost completely parallel to the body if you're looking at the guitar this way. My Parker guitar has an upward slope on the arm 
And the same is true with the Vega Trem. When the arm slants upward, the Trem just fits in your hand a bit nicer and you don't have to change your playing position as much when you're playing the guitar. This arm and this whole arm layout has become my absolute favorite angle and length in turn. So when I'm playing guitar, my whole goal is to be able to have the arm in my hand at all times. No matter if I'm playing chords or if I'm playing lead stuff, I like to have the arm in my hand. Thus then if I wanna use it, I can add it in ever so gently without ruining the flow of what I'm doing. And although I love my Parker, I've had to kind of manipulate my playing in order to hold the trim at all times. So for example, when I'm playing my Parker Nightfly, and I used to actually do this, and in fact, on my course right hand and rhythm, I talk about this. I had to do exercises where I put the trim with my pinky and my ring finger. I had to do exercises where I held this right here and then played various lines on the guitar while being careful not to press too hard on the arm itself while I'm playing. They're so delicate, especially when you're holding it out here, right? Because you're at the end of the lever arm. And as you get closer to the end of the lever arm, the forces amplify for you physics people. If you're holding it out here like I do, the slightest movement is going to change the pitch. And that's very, very difficult to get used to. And when I put this guitar down for a couple of weeks to test a different guitar like I've been doing for the channel, by the time I pick this guitar back up again, I don't have that same touch and it takes me a while to work to get that back. I've noticed with this arm, well, truth be told, I didn't notice. I took this guitar out of the box, didn't adjust anything. I started playing, I used the bridge, and then I went to my normal holding it here like this and miraculously, I wasn't messing with the pitch of the guitar while playing and holding it at the same time. And then when I went to do my all of my stuff, it responded exactly like I wanted it to. was no adjustment period. There was no getting used to it. There was no manipulating my playing style. It just worked perfectly for me somehow right out of the box. So now let's talk about, of course, the pickups. And we're finally to something that I am not over the moon about. I like P90 pickups. I like these the most when it comes to the clean sound. I like this the most when it comes to a dirty sound, but when it comes to a clean sound, I like these the most. The most of my playing is in clean. But here's the thing. These P90s are really loud. And I've said it before, I live in a very old house the shielding isn't great. Single coils have always had an issue in this house, which is why I am so obsessed with my you know, noiseless pickups and all of that stuff. But although these P90s sound good, they make a lot, a lot of noise, even on the clean setting. And although I absolutely love how they sound, Something tells me that if I were to keep this guitar, 
I might have to change the pickups to maybe some gold foils, maybe some type of filter trons. I think that might be a cool little experiment. Here's the second thing. When I'm in the combined position, I get a very strange sound that almost sounds like I'm using a wah pedal when I'm doing funky stuff with my right hand. I like how they sound when they're together and I'm playing simple stuff. When I'm doing fast strumming, it makes that weird sound that I'm not really enjoying. You know, obviously the volume tone knob, they look very traditional, very cool. We have a mirror plate, all of the relicking, all of that stuff. This tone knob has so much range and dynamics to it. I don't know how they wire it. I don't know if there's special capacitors. I, I don't know. But when it's all the way off, we get an amazing, just fat, thick woman tone on the bridge pickup. <laughs> thing that I would also change about it. The neck pickup on this guitar, I like it because I'm, I like uh, I like a really fat, jazzy, warm neck pickup tone. This neck pickup is very, very bassy. It's very wooly. And I have a feeling that some people might not like it. I love it for what I like to do. I'm not sure if you will. If I were keeping this guitar, and if I were keeping these pickups, I would probably wire the tone knob to just be to the bridge pickup, because when the, bridge, when the neck pickup is full on, it's very usable to me, and it's the sound that I would always want. I would never use a tone knob on the neck pickup for this guitar. So now we're going to talk about price, and there's a bit of a story here. So when I got this guitar, I was looking at these guitars on Reverb, and they're about usually 4,500 to 5,000 or even more. And so in the back of my mind, when I had the guitar in my hand, I just kept thinking to myself, you know, would this be worth $4,500 to $5,000? And I also knew from different YouTube reviews that it can take 18 months to get one of these made. So you can imagine I'm practicing, I'm playing the guitar, I'm doing my testing, and I keep thinking to myself, if I wanted this guitar, new i'd have to wait for 18 months ish and i'd probably have to pay like four thousand five hundred to five thousand dollars is it worth it to me is it worth it to me and so i was really enjoying the guitar i was playing more guitar than i had in a long time i actually stayed up very late a few days in a row playing this guitar which i absolutely never never do in fact, if you want to know what I usually do in my life, I have a really interesting video up here, A Day in the Life. No one ever watches this video, but everyone who watches it really enjoys it. So if you want to see my normal wake up, all that stuff, watch that video. Point being, I was staying up late. I was playing this guitar. I was waking up early. I was playing this guitar. And I kept thinking, 18 months, $4,500 to $5,000. And right before... I started making the review, I finally decided, yeah, I would go on a Novo site, I would pick the most boring, simple paint job and the most boring, simple features. Um, I would keep the bridge, but I would keep everything else as boring as possible so I can maybe get the price down to 4,400, 4,500, somewhere around there and this guitar would be worth it and I wouldn't regret my purchase. But then I actually finally went to the Novo site because I was trying to figure out more about this guitar. And I saw that they have this other thing you can do, you know, where it's like a two to three month wait or whatever, and you can get basically this exact guitar for $3,200. I would pay, 30. I would impulse buy this guitar for $3,200. I would max out a credit card 
today and buy this guitar for $3,200. And that's coming from someone who has never, never liked traditional guitars, who's never wanted a traditional guitar, who only aspired to play modern guitars. This is officially one of my favorite guitars of all time. But here's the thing about my opinion on this guitar that you have to remember and keep in mind before making your decision. I personally don't have much experience with vintage styled guitars whatsoever. I'm a modern guitar guy. So I can tell you about Parker's, I can tell you about uh, Mayones, I can tell you about Kiesel guitars, right? And I can say something like, if you have $2,000, go build a custom Kiesel and that will probably be all you need. But I have never played a Nags guitar. I've never played a, Gist, a Gibson Custom Shop guitar. I've never played a short guitar for longer than a couple of minutes. So although I absolutely love this guitar and I would spend $4,000 for it, no question, easily $3,200 for it, I'm not an expert on vintage or boutique guitars. That being said, it's very comfortable to me. It stays in tune like no one's business. And apart from the noise, these pickups are absolutely awesome. This guitar is 100% a winner in my book. However, Novo does have another company that's part of it that makes similar guitars that are a lot cheaper. I wonder how that one compares and perhaps you'll learn soon too. If you want to watch any of my other gear reviews, I'm sure you'll like those as well. I have them linked up here. Believe it or not, I'm also a much better guitar teacher than I am a guitar reviewer. So check out some of my lessons right here as well. By the way, I'm Andre Flood, and I'll talk to you soon.